Hello students. So now we will continue with the lecture on linear regression with multiple regressors. This is the third part of this particular lecture. So now we will talk about the least squares assumptions that underlie multiple regression. We have looked at the least squares assumptions for regression with one regressor. Now we are going to extend it to the least squares assumptions for multiple regression. So this is our population regression model which is yi is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 xi 1 plus beta 2 x2i plus up to beta k xki. So you are including k regressors plus ui. So you uh, have a predicted uh, regression plane. Uh, in this case, this will be a hyperplane that will include all of these dimensions x1, x2 up to xk and still because it is a stochastic relationship, there will be an error left over which is ui and i equals to 1 to n and these uh, parameters, unknown parameters beta 0, beta 1 up to beta k will be estimated from a sample and the estimates will be known as beta 0 hat, beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat and so on. So the assumptions that underlie uh, this model is that the first assumption is that the conditional distribution of u given x has mean 0. So basically what we are saying is expected value of u given x1 is equal to takes a value of x1, x2 takes a value of x2 and so on and xk takes a value of xk. The expected value of the error is equal to me, uh, 0. So this is very similar to one, the uh, regression with one variable where we said that u given x is equal to x is equal to 0. So basically we are trying to build that regression model where on average the errors will be 0. So the number of so the amount of positive errors and the negative errors will cancel each other out. Even when you build a multiple regression model you are trying to build that regression model where the errors will on average be 0. The second uh, assumption is that X I, x1i up to xki i equals to 1 to n are iid. So basically what you are saying that each of these observations that you have taken that is uh, first observation, second observation, third observation, fourth observation and you have these variables for each of these observations that is y and x1 and x2 so on and so forth x3 up to xk. So each of these variables, each of these observations that you are taking are independently and identically distributed with each other. That is each of these observations are independent from each other and each of these observations uh, in the sample come from an identical distribution. So how is this um, ensured? This is ensured by as, uh, seeing that they are randomly, uh, the observations are randomly selected. So they are independent of each other. The th third assumption is that large outliers are unlikely. So we assume that all our variables, they are bounded and they do not have very small or very large values. That is, they, do, they are not, it's not, they don't follow a fat tail distribution. The expected value of the fourth order of x1 to the power of 4 is less than infinity and up to x, xk to the power of 4 expected value is less than infinity. All that it means is that there are no very large outliers in any of these values. And the fourth assumption that we now include in a multiple regression which we did not have in the single regression is that there is no perfect multicollinearity. And we will define this term and we will see what perfect multicollinearity means. 
So the first assumption is the conditional mean of u given the included x's is 0. Expected value of u given x1 takes some values x1 and xk takes values fxk is equal to 0. This has the same interpretation as in regression with a single regressor. Failure of this condition leads to omitted variable bias. So if in fact your error is not if this uh, expected value of u given these as uh, these uh, included variables is zero means that u is not correlated with any of the included uh, variables u is not correlated but if u is still correlated with some of the included variables then maybe you have missed out on some uh, variable which is uh, in fact uh, you have not included uh, which may cause omitted variable bias. Specifically if an omitted variable belongs in the equation so is in u and is correlated with an included x then this condition fails and there is omitted variable bias. So the beta 1 hats and the beta 2 hats up to the beta k hats that you estimate from the equation if in fact you have missed out on including some important um, uh, some important variable which uh, affects y and which is also correlated with one of the included uh, regressors then if you have missed out on including such a variable then uh, they, you, there may be an omitted variable bias in the estimated beta coefficients that you have estimated. So whenever you build a regression uh, model I will ask you or you you may think of yourself that whether in fact you have there may be some omitted variable bias in the model that you have uh, built. The best solution if possible is to include the omitted variables in the regression. Ideally you should include all the omitted variables in the regression. Uh, if you are if the data is not available on all the omitted variables that should be included sometimes data is a problem if the data is not available then you might include a different variable that controls for the omitted variable now this is a somewhat uh, this this variable is known as instrumental variable okay instrumental variable we are not going to introduce this concept in this uh, particular course but this is a word that I am uh, you know uh, stating now so that you know that later on if you want to look it up you can see what instrumental variables do and how if you don't have all the variables uh, to take care of omitted variable bias you might be able to include an instrumental variable to take care of omitted variable bias. The second assumption is of course that x1 up to xk are iid. This is satisfied automatically if the data is collected by simple random sampling. The third assumption is that large outliers are rare, finite fourth moments. This is the same assumption as we had before for a single regressor. OLS can be sensitive to large outliers. If you have some of the ways, some of the data is uh, very much out of the um, out of the uh, typical values of x1 or x2 or something then you might fit a particular uh, line which is actually not the typical line it may be influenced by the large outliers as we saw in the single variable case so you need to check your data make scatter plots of y with each of the x's to make sure that there are no crazy values you know there are just make sure that uh, the values are all within reasonable bounds. The fourth assumption that we are introducing in the case of multiple regression is that there is no perfect multicollinearity. So what is perfect multicollinearity? Perfect multicollinearity is happens when one of the regressors is an exact linear function of the other regressors. So you are building a uh, uh, regression model where y equals to beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 uh, plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3. Suppose x3 is given as uh, x1 plus 2 x2. For some reason you have included a particular x3 but x3 is exactly defined as this. So x3 is an exact linear combination of x1 and x2. In this case 
uh, there is perfect multicollinearity. So, for instance, how can perfect multicollinearity occur? So, over here that is shown, you will see that in this model, the variable str has been erroneously included twice. So, you will find that the str has been included once over here and by mistake you have typed it again in your regression equation. So, what the uh, many softwares, uh, software uh, regression softwares will do is they will automatically drop it the second time it has been included. Even if it is named something else and it is included, it will be dropped if it gives exactly the same values or it has the, it's exactly the same vector as some other vector, then it will be dropped. <coughs> and then uh, the regression will be built uh, normally. Okay. Um, so, perfect multicollinearity is when one of the regressors is an exact linear function of the other regressors. So, in the previous regression, beta 1 is the effect on test score of a unit change in STR holding STR constant. So, what are we uh, looking at? We uh, said what is the uh, beta 1, this beta 1 is the effect of one unit change in STR while holding STR constant. So, you cannot change STR and at the same time hold STR constant. So, that is not possible. So, uh, you cannot really do that unit change in STR while holding STR constant. So, this is perfect multicollinearity. So, we will return to perfect and imperfect multicollinearity shortly with more examples. So, with these least square assumptions in hand, that is now we have four least square assumptions. With these least square assumptions in hand, uh, we can uh, now derive the sampling distribution of beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat up to beta k hat. So, we have discuss, we have uh, talked of the idea of sampling distribution and we will again talk of the sampling distribution of the OLS estimator for a multiple regression model. So, under the four least square assumptions, the sampling distribution. So, why again uh, to sort of recall the idea of the sampling distribution, we are reiterating what we had said before. That is, we, you have estimated the values of beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat up to beta k hat from a given sample. Now, if, the, if you had got a different sample, you might have got a different value of, so you have estimated beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat uh, up to beta k hat for a given sample, uh, from a given sample. If you had a different sample, you might have got a different value of beta 1 hat. So, this is beta 1, beta 1 hat, beta 2 1, beta k 1. So, this is beta 1 2, beta 1, uh, beta 2 2, uh, the second index, uh, index is for which sample you are taking from beta k 2 hat. So, you would have got a different value of the uh, estimated coefficients. So, hence the value there is a sampling uncertainty that is or there is an underlying distribution that each of these estimated uh, beta coefficients follow and this, this distribution that each of these beta coefficients have is known as the sampling distribution. Now, we will state a few properties of this sampling, estimate, uh, sampling distribution for the beta coefficients. So, the sampling distribution of beta 1 hat has mean beta 1 under these uh, uh, under these assumptions. If, if the first four least square assumptions are met, that is the mean of this sampling distribution will tend towards the population mean. If n is large, the mean of the sampling distribution will tend towards population mean if the in probability. So, if n is large, beta 1 hat will tend towards the true population mean. Mm, a true population beta 1. Again, the variance of beta 1 hat will be inversely proportional to n. So, as we have seen before, the, as you have larger and larger sample sizes, not only will the mean uh, get closer and closer to the true population mean, but the variance in the beta 1 hat will also decrease as n becomes larger and larger. 
other than its mean and uh, variance the exact finite and uh, distribution of beta 1 hat is complicated so we will not uh, talk about it now but for large n by law of large numbers beta 1 hat will be consistent that is beta 1 hat will uh, tend towards the true population mean and by the central limit theorem or CLT this quantity which is our z score beta 1 hat minus the expected value of beta 1 hat divided by the root of variance of beta 1 hat uh, this z score will be approximately distributed according to a standard normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation of 1. So by now you should be familiar with these uh, these uh, 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 what will happen in large samples due, uh, for the sampling distribution of some population parameters uh, population means. So you we know that by central limit theorem this will be approximately distributed according to a standard normal distribution. So these statements hold for each of the each of the estimated parameters beta 1 hat up to beta k hat given that this will be distributed according to a standard normal distribution we can now test hypothesis for each of the estimated parameters okay so we will not we will uh, discuss that in another class but basically we can test hypothesis for each of the estimated parameters now we come to the idea of multicollinearity we assume that there is no perfect multicollinearity. This was the fourth assumption. So perfect multicollinearity is when one of the regressors is an exact linear function of the uh, other regressors. So what are some of the uh, examples of perfect multicollinearity? One is that you might include STR twice that which is what we showed before or you can uh, you might regress test score on a constant d and b where d1 is equal to 1 if str less than equal to 0 20 and uh, is equal to 0 otherwise so you create two discrete variables the discrete variable b takes on a value of 1 for uh, small class sizes and takes on a value of 0 for large class sizes and uh, similarly b takes a value of 0 for small class sizes and takes a value of 1 for large class sizes. Now see if a class size is either small or large. So if you have said that uh, so it can the you know the if you add d and b up uh, uh, I, I, what is the probability that a person you know it can either be 1 or 0 so if you add one d and b up it will be 1 so b can be derived from d by saying 1 minus d so b is equal to 1 minus d so everywhere d takes a value of 1 b will necessarily take a value of 0 so b is described as a linear function of d okay so b is described as 1 minus d it is a linear function of d and hence there is perfect multicollinearity okay so you can there is no need to add both of these uh, dummy variables uh, for under, uh, for the size of the class you can add just one of these dummy variables and that will be good enough because the other one can be derived if one is defined the other one can be derived from that Again, there would be my perfect multicollinearity of the intercept constant were uh, excluded from this regression. Okay, so if if the intercept were excluded, maybe the, there would not be perfect multicollinearity. Let us look at it a little bit more. So when there is a perfect linear relationship, assume we have the following model y equals to beta 1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus e, where the sample values for x2 and x3 are x2 takes values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and x3 takes, a, takes values 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Now is there perfect multicollinearity here? Yeah. As you can see, x3 is exactly equal to 2 times x2. So, x3 is a linear combination of x2. 
so there is perfect multicollinearity even though the values are different but it's a linear combination once x2 is defined x3 is also completely defined so there is perfect multicollinearity here so so we come to the idea also there if there is multi perfect multicollinearity then what will happen is the uh, regression will not be performed at all so this is because of the way in which uh, the uh, the beta coefficients are estimated that is using linear algebra and if you uh, you when you try to take a determinant of that uh, matrix what will happen is the determinant of that matrix will be zero and hence you will not be able to invert the matrix uh, if two uh, two columns are exactly the same then you uh, the determinant of the matrix will be zero for this reason you will not be able to invert the matrix and hence you will not be able to solve that minimization problem this is why perfect multi collinearity uh, will not allow you to solve the uh, minimization problem and arrive at the values of beta 1 hat beta 2 hat etc now we come to the idea of the dummy variable trap so suppose you have a set a set of multiple multiple binary dummy variables which are mutually exclusive and exhaustive that is there are multiple categories and every observation falls in one and only one category so one is of course you know you could have uh, males females other gender or whatever you could have uh, categories like that or you could have uh, in this particular case suppose you are saying that days of the week you know does the day of the week have an effect on stock prices many people do uh, research like this so each of these are in uh, uh, are uh, mutually exclusive if uh, a stock is being sold on sunday it is not being sold on monday so they are mutually exclusive and also if it has been sold on uh, any of one of these seven days then it could not possibly be sold on any other day of the week so these seven days consist of all the categories uh, which could possibly occur okay so in such a case uh, you might include a day of the week uh, dummy variable and a day of the week dummy variable or you could include a dummy variable called um, you could include a dummy variable for each day of the week such as Sunday, Monday, uh, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday so on and so forth, Thursday, uh, Friday, Saturday. Now if you include all of these then you will run into a dummy variable if you create a value for all of these you will run into a dummy variable trap i will show you how that will happen so when you have some uh, binary independent variables which are mutually uh, exclusive and uh, exhaustive all the, they are exhaustive then uh, if you include all these dummy variables and a constant you will have perfect multicollinearity so this is known as the dummy variable trap so why is there perfect multicollinearity here so let me show you what will happen so suppose you have um, suppose you have you know uh, a particular stock so you have um, you know these particular days of the week let us not take a stock price because stock markets are not open on weekends so let us say go uh, someone is going for a movie okay and sunday monday so these uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and we are trying to see how much are the sales of the uh, sales of movie tickets on different days. So uh, individual A, individual B, individual C and so on these are the these are the observations individual a went to movie on uh, sunday and did not go to the movie on any of the other days individual b went to a movie on sunday and did not go 
uh, for a movie on any of the other days suppose they are going on only one day a particular movie has released and they are going on only one day of the week to watch the movie they are not going uh, two or three times to watch the same movie suppose this is the case then what will happen is uh, individual C may be so on and so forth individual D may, may have gone on Wednesday individual E would have gone on Thursday F like that so what will happen is if if an individual has and assume that everyone has gone for a movie on one day or the other F and G so this particular G variable that is uh, people who have not gone on any of these other days they will necessarily have gone in this day so this day can be actually taken as 7 minus the summation of whether they have gone on any of the other days if they have gone on any of the other days then uh, uh, you know whatever uh, it will be oh, sorry not 7 minus 1 minus the summation of uh, any of the other days days i equals to 1 to 6 so if they have gone on it not gone on any of the other days then they have gone on saturday but if they have gone on any of the other days then they have not gone on saturday so that will become 1 and 1 minus 1 it will become 0 so whether saturday takes a value of 1 or 0 can be completely determined by uh, the data given by all the other uh, all the other uh, days uh, movie going data so in this particular case given the fact that they are mutually exclusive and they are exhaustive these dummy variables um, so if you have data for k minus 1 variables you or k minus 1 dummy variables you will also know the value for the kth variable just by doing 1 minus the uh, summation of all the k minus 1 variables and this is why there will be a dummy variable trap in this particular case okay so this is something that you have to avoid if you use dummy variables in your uh, models then be sure to see that you have not included a dummy variable for every single category rather you might have left out one of the categories because that will be the reference category with respect to which you will have uh, all the other coefficients will be determined so perfect multicollinearity usually reflects a mistake in the definition of the regressors or an oddity in the data if you have perfect multicollinearity your statistical software will let you know either by crashing or giving an error message or by dropping one of the uh, variables arbitrarily in R what it does is it drops one of the uh, variables that is uh, that has perfect multicollinearity uh, multi so the solution to perfect multicollinearity is to modify your list of regressors so that you no longer have perfect multicollinearity so drop one of the variables now we come to the idea of imperfect multicollinearity so imperfect and perfect multicollinearity are quite different despite the similarity of the names imperfect multicollinearity occurs when two or more regressors are very highly correlated okay so perfect multicollinearity happens when uh, correlation between x1 and x2 is equal to 1 this is one is perfect multicollinearity but suppose it is less than one and it suppose it is 0.9 or 0.8 or something the cor correlation between two variables then you have something that is called imperfect multicollinearity and in reality actually many times our variables are sort of uh, correlated so why the time multicollinearity because they are varying linearly or they are varying collinearly with each other uh, so if two regressors are very highly correlated then the scatter plot will pretty much look like a straight line they are collinear but unless the correlation is exactly plus minus point one, one the that could collinearity is imperfect 
So imperfect multicollinearity implies that one or more of the regression coefficients will be imprecisely estimated. Okay, so if you have two variables that are uh, sort of correlated with each other, then the betas that will be calculated or the betas that will be estimated for each of these uh, variables may not be, uh, may be somewhat uh, not correctly estimated. So the reason for this or you may not even if they are estimated uh, correctly the variance associated with these betas uh, may be slightly higher. So the reason for this is as follows. Okay, Let us give an intuitive reason for first. Um, so the coefficient on x1 is the effect of x1 holding x2 constant. So this you remember, right? So in a uh, multiple linear regression, the uh, effect of, uh, so beta 1 hat is equal to del y by del x1 uh, while holding x2 uh, up to xk constant if you have uh, k variables. So this is beta 1 hat. This is the interpretation of beta 1 hat. Now if, uh, if one of these x2s is highly correlated with um, x1 then what will happen is if you hold x2 constant then uh, so there is very little variation in x1 when x2 is held constant once x2 is held constant x1 will also not be able to vary or there will be a very small portion of x1 which will be free to vary once x2 is held constant. So the data do doesn't contain much information about what happens when x1 changes but x2 doesn't. Okay, So the two variables are highly correlated. You can't really hold a one constant and try to see. The extreme of this happens of course that when there is perfect multicollinearity but even if there is imperfect multicollinearity you run into a problem. So so two variables are highly correlated. You can't really hold one constant and see uh, what is the effect on y of a change in the other. So the variance of the OLS estimator on x1 will be large. So the variance means that the OLS estimator has a sampling distribution, right? The variance of that sampling distribution will re result will become higher. So there will be large standard errors. There is a complicated math uh, behind this. If you are interested, you can see in Stock and Watson in Appendix 6.2, but I am not going to go there. I will just show you. Uh, so let me just first show you uh, in a uh, visual way a set diagram interpretation of multicollinearity. So suppose you have this is your dependent variable y and this is your independent variable x and this is your independent variable w. Now uh, y, uh, x uh, and uh, w are correlated with y and you are trying to find out what is that correlation. So when you when you are trying to when you are holding w constant and you are trying to see what is the effect of a change in x on y basically you are looking at this blue part of the uh, blue part so basically only in this area you will be able to because if you hold w constant you are not allowing this red part to change even though it is part of x so only this blue part you are allowing it to change and you are trying to see what is the effect on y S but when w x and w are have a high overlap between them then the red overlapping portion is very high and there is very little information left in x which will allow you to see that with a unit change in x what is the change in y. Similarly there is very little information left in the green part which will allow you to see that while holding x constant what is the effect on y of a unit change in w. So this is sort of a visual, uh, visual uh, un, you know, interpretation of what happens when there is imperfect multicollinearity. So what happens with the variance of the estimated beta coefficient? As we know 
that the beta estimated beta coefficient has a sampling distribution so it has a mean uh, that sampling distribution has a mean and it has a variance so the variance of beta 1 hat is given for one uh, uh, one uh, single uh, uh, single regressor uh, regression it was given by this formula s square by n minus 1 multiplied by variance uh, hat of x1 you can check this out we have talked about this before which is s square by n minus 1 summation i equals to 1 to n x1 minus x bar whole square so basically as the variance of x increases uh, the variance of beta decreases because this is in the uh, this is in the denominator so as as you get more and more information about x you are more sure about the or your uh, your confidence about the slope of the line increases now for two or more explanatory variables what happens is this original uh, uh, original beta hat uh, remains the variance remains but it is multiplied by 1 by 1 minus rj square where rj square is the correlation between the jth variable so here you are looking at the bj uh, variance of bj hat so the jth variable with the other variables so in each case you are seeing whether the jth variable is correlated with any of the other variables and if there is high correlation with any of the other variables this is a uh, summed up uh, correlation rj square uh, if the correlation is high with any of the other variables then what will happen is this quantity will uh, become higher so 1 minus this quantity will become smaller this denominator will become smaller and as a result of which this total this total factor will become larger so as the correlation becomes higher this factor is known as the variance inflation factor okay so it is inflating the variance this factor is inflating your variance and by how much it is inflating the variance is dependent upon how correlated uh, the different uh, independent included independent variables are so these are the ways some of the uh, some of the uh, variance inflation factors if there is no correlation between the jth variable and any of the other variables then your variance inflation factor is 1 so absolutely there is no inflation in variance if there is some correlation between the included variable and the other variables uh, 0 0.5 still the variance inflation factor is 2 if there is a higher correlation 0 0.8 variance inflation factor is 5 if there is a higher even correlation 0 0.9 the variance inflation factor is 10 so this variance inflation factor is just being calculated by 1 minus uh, 1 mi uh, 1 by 1 minus r square j so if you just input these values of r square j over here you will get these values of variance inflation factor so as you can see as the correlation becomes larger and larger between the uh, included variables the variance inflation factor be also becomes very large so vif values that exceed 10 are generally viewed as evidence of the existence of problematic multicollinearity when does vif value become more than uh, 10 so as you can see if you have correlation of 0.9 or higher then the VIA factors become 10 20 40 and becomes more than 10 so those are cases of problematic uh, multicollinearity this happens if RJ square is greater than 0 0.9 so large standard errors will lead to large confidence interval so you will what will happen is as the variance incre increases if you remember the standard errors will also increase and your t statistics will become smaller and you will be able to not really be able to 
uh, say whether your uh, coefficients are statistically significant or not and also the uh, confidence intervals will be uh, this so you may have t statistics that are totally wrong the t statistics may not actually give you any information on, on whether the included variables are, has, are statistically significant or not so when imperfect multicollinearity is present estimates of OLS may be imprecise because of large standard errors affected coefficients may fail to attain statistical significance due to low t statistics so if you have two variables so you are trying to uh, determine y equals to uh, beta 0 plus beta 1 uh, x1 plus beta 2 x2 and suppose you find that x1 and x2 are highly correlated you may f you may actually get uh, re, uh, get beta 0 hats and beta 1 hats which may not be statistically significant because the error is high you may find that the t statistics are quite small small okay but this is an erroneous uh, conclusion because you have included two highly uh, correlated va fact, uh, variables if you dropped one of these variables you may suddenly find that this uh, this variable becomes highly statistically significant or uh, the t statistics become much larger and sometimes in fact uh, including uh, two highly correlated variables may even lead to sign, si uh, sign reversals of the beta, uh, beta coefficients ok so sign reversals might exist addition or deletion of few observations if you uh, add or delete a few observations ideally in your sample if you add or delete a few observations your beta 1 hats and beta 2 hats should not change much but if there is high correlation then may there uh, uh, even if you add or delete a few observations there may be substantial changes in the estimated coefficient so basically you cannot have a lot of confidence in the estimated coefficients so how do you detect multicollinearity the easiest way to measure the extent of multicollinearity is to simply look at the matrix of correlations between the individual variables so before you build your regression first run a correlation find a correlation matrix between uh, x1 x2 um, between all the uh, independent variables you know uh, find the correlation matrix so you may of course the correlation between x1 and x1 will be 1 and x2 and x2 will be 1 and so on now you see what is the correlation between x1 and x2 this may be 0 0.5 this may be 0 0.3 so on and so forth but in some case if you find that they are highly correlated then you may want to see whether you want to include those both of those variables or get rid of one of the variables so first do a multi uh, multi collinearity check or first look at the correlation matrix none of the t ratios of the individual coefficients may be statistically significant but the overall f statistic it's we mean we have not yet uh, introduced the idea of the f statistic but basically what it says is that it may be your results may be telling you that overall the regression model is doing well but somehow individually none of the uh, variables seem to have uh, any st statistically significant effect on y so if there are several variables in the model and not all are not highly correlated with other variables this alone may not be enough you could get a mix of significant and insignificant results disguising the fact that some coefficients are insignificant because of multicollinearity this is why you should always check for multicollinearity before you do the you should run the correlation matrix what how can you resolve multicollinearity you can drop one of the multicollinear variables uh, you can do something like ridge regression which I am not going to introduce now but ridge regression takes care or you can use a method of uh, principal components or you can do something that is called partial least square uh, regression all of these are slightly advanced topics which I am not going to talk of there are ways of getting re resolving multicollinearity sometimes you just drop one of the multicollinear variables okay so uh, some econometricians say that multicollinearity if uh, 
the model is okay you can ignore multicollinearity so there may there will always be some level of multicollinearity especially in time series data in time series data there is a lot of multicollinearity here we are talking of cross sectional data okay so um, here, uh, so the easiest way to cure the problems are to drop one of the collinear variables um, uh, or to transform some of the highly correlated variables into a ratio. And this is often done in financial, uh, corporate finance kind of uh, problems where you may have something like uh, you may have uh, you know whatever operating costs and you might have uh, sales costs and you might have other kinds of costs and these may be somewhat correlated with each other so sometimes maybe transforming them into some kind of a ratio may work okay uh, if you include two variables to create a particular ratio you can go out and collect more data to see whether they are genuinely correlated you can look at a longer series of data in the case of time series or you can switch to a high, higher frequency so these are some of the ways of resolving multicollinearity so this is where we will stop our lecture on multiple linear regression